Welcome to another service of Calvary Baptist Church. We've come this morning to worship. Come, now is the time to worship. service here this morning, and we're glad you're with us. I have a couple of announcements to make. Dan and Trudy's wedding is scheduled for Saturday, April 4th, and it is going to take place on that day, but it is limited just to family to attend. We are going to live stream the ceremony starting at 1.30. It'll be on Calvary Baptist T-Berg Facebook account, and later we will post it on our website as well. The reception is not going to happen that day, but has been postponed to a later date, not yet determined. So if you're planning to come to their wedding, you can watch it live, and then we'll all get together later when we can and have a great reception and fellowship time together. In addition to today's service, which you can see on our Awana and our church Facebook accounts, our church website, or you can pick up a DVD here at the church, and those will be ready prior to Sunday service. So if you're watching this right now, Sunday, you already realize you got your DV earlier than this. We'll have a short Bible study available on Sunday. It'll be on the church Facebook account probably Sunday evening. So if you want to watch for that, that'll be live or it'll be posted there. Also on Monday, we will have another Awana Council time available on our Awana Facebook page. And that'll happen sometime Monday afternoon or evening. So watch out for that as well. Psalm 95, verses 2 and 3 is our call to worship this morning. Come, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. We'll be looking in Exodus this morning and seeing how God truly is sovereign over all, and we'll be rejoicing in that. Let's pray together as we begin. Dear Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we can, even through the means of the Internet and through cameras, that we can worship together, that we can praise your name, and that we can study your word and be encouraged and taught by it. We thank you for that. We pray that our time together, whether it be just in small family gatherings or maybe someone is alone and able to watch this on their own, we pray that your spirit would be with them and encourage them in this time as we spend together in fellowshipping with you because you cross all of the boundaries that we cannot you cross all of the times that we can only exist in one moment, and you're there always. We thank you for that. We pray for your blessing on us today. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to continue to sing about the salvation that God offers us at Calvary. Here's a 
died in vanity and pride, bearing not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. scripture reading this morning comes from Exodus chapter 5. It's the first four verses. If you happen to be here in our auditorium and you had a chair Bible, it'd be page 68. If you've taken one of those home, it's still on page 68. But we'll have you read along with us Exodus chapter 5, the first four verses. This is just the beginning of a long narrative we're going to consider this morning from Exodus chapter 5 all the, through, all the way through Exodus chapter 12 when the question we will answer is the question posed by Pharaoh himself. 
who is the Lord? And the question really is, who are we in relationship to the Lord? Not have I gotten, but what I received. Praise has bestowed it since I have believed. Those things excluded. So today we're going to do that. I was going to say, why don't you greet one another? While our kids are dismissed, but our kids are here, and uh, in wherever you are, they're with you. And so I thought I'd do a message for them and talk about uh, a little bit about the topic what we're dealing with today. And now that they've all gathered here in front of me, I brought up some things with me because I want to talk to our kids just for a few moments here. But what is the square root of 64? The square root of 64. Everybody should know that. It's 8. I was going to do something more difficult, but maybe for, maybe for my grandchildren, this might be a little challenging. They're working on addition and subtraction, and they haven't gotten multiplication and division and square roots. Here's another question. This is about knowledge. Sometimes we take tests that relate to knowledge. How tall is Mount Everest? How tall is Mount Everest? It used to be 29,002 feet, and then it became 29,016 feet. So somehow it grew. We're not exactly sure how that happened, and maybe it's grown a little more. So Mount Everest, that's a, that's a test on, on your knowledge. That's just one kind of test. I brought a different kind of test with me today, and that is a test of our strength. Now, I brought with me a metal, a metal rod, a metal rod, and uh, I was going to bend this for you because I'm very strong. Then I realized I used this to put my painting roller on, and I don't actually want to ruin a $5 rod. But, you know, some of you would like, if we had the kids here, and probably even the worst team members, like to come up here and just bend this thing. You can see it's slightly bending. And I don't know that I'm strong enough. You see those strong men, and they take an iron bar, and they bend it. And then I go, yeah, but let's see you straighten it once it's bent. Sometimes we test our strength. We get, we, how much weight can we lift? What, what things can we do? But then I thought, there's one other thing we should really try and test, and that's our courage. And I brought something here that maybe you are familiar with if your dad does any kind of work. I don't know if you're familiar with an electric wire. Now, I'm not going to tell you whether or not this is plugged in on the other end, but here you have the white, which means something. And the black, which means something. Now, I know the ground is okay because it doesn't carry any power. It's just to keep you from dying. And I'm not sure about the others. So if I went and touched <laughs> the black, do you have the courage to touch a live wire? Well, these aren't live. I'm not crazy. But sometimes we test courage. Now, when we take a test, the question becomes is, what should we get when we Pass the test. When you pass the test, there should be some kind of reward, right? And what reward would you like? Would you like to receive when you pass the test a beautiful certificate? Something you can hang on your wall, something your 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 parents could post in a in a frame, a certificate that says, You are the most courageous, you are the strongest, you are the smartest. Or would you rather just have someone <laughs> ring a bell? You know, you get the question right, and they ring the bell. I'm thinking my daughter should probably take this home for homeschooling, and every time they get a math problem right, you can ring the bell, ring the bell, ring the bell, ring the bell. After a while, ringing the bell kind of wears on you. Now, if you pass the test, here's what I would like to get. A chocolate bunny. If I'm going to pass the test, I want something that is immediately 
wonderful. And this one is chocolate crisp. Oh, it's got the Rice Krispies in it. I don't know if they're the real Rice Krispies or they're generic, but it doesn't matter because this is the chocolate bunny. And if after the service, if you're hungry, you can come up and get this. <laughs> I'm only saying that to the viewer here right now. I have another question for you. I'm going to give you kids a test at home, and here's how this is going to work. If you get the answers right to this test, then you should go to your parents and say, you owe me a reward. Okay, that's how it should work. You get these questions. Here's the three questions. They're going to be answered in the message. Who was Abraham's son? Who was Abraham's son? That's what we studied the last two weeks out of Genesis chapter 20 and 22. The second question is, what do frogs have to do with Egypt? What do frogs have to do with Egypt? And you're going to hear something about Egypt in this morning's message. What do frogs have to do with that? And the third thing is, what animal, it's obviously not frogs, we already dealt with frogs, what animal was involved in the test of the Passover? You may not know anything about Passover, but at the end of the message, we'll talk about Passover, passing over. When God passes over the people, there's an animal involved. I want you to identify that. All right, kids, that's your assignments for today. Now we're going to get down to the adults and talk to them for a few moments. You know, when Abraham went up to Mount Moriah in, in Genesis chapter 20 and 22, when he went up to Mount Moriah with his son Isaac and he raised his knife, that's where we were last week, he raised his knife to sacrifice him. Many might see that as God being rather heartless. That God would seek the innocent blood of a of a young man, Isaac, just for his own pleasure. Do you know, throughout history, there have been societies who have, I believe, wrongly interpreted God. They have seen God as a God who makes demands of them, who needs to be appeased. You know what appeased means? You have to give them a sacrifice to appease God. And they have thought that in some of those sacrifices, it should go as far as human offerings, even children. So some ancient cultures, seeing the story of Isaac and Abraham and not reading the whole story, would say, well, yeah, that's exactly what we do. There's nothing wrong with sacrificing someone to God because God demands certain things from us. But God, I believe, did not want Abraham to kill his son. The test was not, will you kill your son? The question was, will you fear me? Will, God, will Abraham fear God? So God, instead of having him sacrifice his son, what did he do? He sent a ram in the thicket that would be the sacrifice. Blood was going to be shed for the sacrifice, but it was going to be the ram's blood. It was not going to be human blood. It was not going to be our blood. The ram was going to die, and Isaac was going to live. And Isaac would live, and he would have his own sons. He'd have two. And his younger son, Jacob, would go on and have 12 of his own. Remember, Isaac... Remember, Abraham had been promised by God that he'd have a nation of children. And the process has begun through Jacob. Now, one of the sons of Jacob was Joseph. And Joseph, of course, was the youngest son until the last son came. You ever been the youngest until the next come? I was the youngest for 10 years. And then my younger brother came. But I've always been considered the youngest of the three. Well, Joseph was the youngest of the 11 until Benjamin came. And his brothers hated him, and they sold him into slavery. And, and, and because of Joseph, 70 people in the family of Jacob went into Egypt and ended up becoming millions of people. Throughout the years, when we think about the time of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and the years that Israel is in Egypt, we find that God does not talk about man's sin. You read in the Bible, nowhere does he drop in and say, you know, you have a sin problem. And what's interesting is you read those same pages in the scriptures, you don't find man actively looking for God and seeking his forgiveness. It's not there. What you find is man just apparently living his life day to day, year upon year, for 400 years. So Jacob's family grows over 400 years into millions of people. And for four, think about 400 years. For us to look back 400 years, we don't even exist as a nation. If our ancestors are part of those who originally came here, our ancestors go back to England or maybe to France or maybe to Germany. But they certainly aren't here if you go back 400 years. And for 400 years, 
Jacob's family has simply lived its life until one day, Pharaoh fears the strength of this nation of people and enslaves them. And they suffer under bondage, and yet they still grow. And God does not forget his promises to Abraham. He doesn't forget his promise to Isaac and Jacob. Instead, God comes to a man by the name of Moses, a prince of the pharaohs, who is now a shepherd in Midian. And in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 6, notice what it says. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 6. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, so I have come down to deliver them. So Moses returns to Egypt and stands before the king. And in Exodus chapter 5, what we read this morning, it says, Moses says this to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord God of Israel, let my people go. And Pharaoh asked the question, who is the Lord? That I should obey his voice and let Israel go. That's the question this morning, who is the Lord? When it comes to salvation, when it comes to our eternal destiny, when it comes to just living here and now, the question becomes is, who is the Lord? And should I listen to him? Why should I obey him? Is there a God to whom I answer? It's interesting. I, I, I read a post uh, yesterday relating to this whole COVID-19, and there was a man, a, a scientist, who predicted this pandemic in 2005. He's one of the leading pandemic researchers in the country. He predicted not this particular one, but he said, this is going to happen. And he lives in San Francisco. He lives in the counties in San Francisco. And so he's in lockdown. And in this interview he gave, he was talking about the fact that I saw this coming. I knew this was going to happen, and we're going to have to ride out this storm. But here's what he said. Being a man of faith, this is what he said in the interview, being a man of faith, I wonder if we shouldn't be thinking about how God might be involved in this. I thought that was extremely refreshing in a mainline publication, in an article being spread across the world from an expert on pandemic research saying, I'm a man of faith and wondering what God might be doing. Is there a God to whom I must answer? And the question is, if there is, do I fear him? Here's a phrase I want you to catch. It'll come on the screen if you can see it, but listen carefully if you can't. Salvation does not rest in what we pay. See, some would think Abraham going on top of the mountain and sacrificing his son is paying for his salvation. But it is in who God is. See, the question for Abraham was not what do I do, it's who do I fear. Salvation does not rest in what we pay, but in who God is. Israel and Egypt are going to learn this lesson. This is the lesson of the plague narrative. Israel and Egypt are to learn this lesson. The question is, are they going to learn it the easy way or the hard way? Sometimes we like to learn some things the easy way. We're willing to do some research, listen to the research, and make our decision. Other times we're going, ah, oh, I don't believe any of that. I'm just going to go out and try this, and we have to learn lessons the hard way. Each time Moses goes to Pharaoh, and we're not going to look at all the narrative. We're not going to read chapters 5 through 12, not at all. But each time Moses goes to Pharaoh, Pharaoh says no. And God brings a plague. Exodus chapter 7, verse 14 says this. And each time Pharaoh, each time Moses goes to him, Pharaoh's heart is hard. He refuses to let the people go. See, the question is, when he first says who is the Lord in chapter 5? Over the next four chapters, the Lord comes face to face through the plagues to Pharaoh, and he continues to ask the question, well, who are you? And he hardens his heart. Who is the Lord? He's the one who tests our heart. That's what we find here in this text, that the Lord is the one who tests. He wants to reveal what's inside us. Think about what's inside you Right now, this week, what you've experienced. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? In Exodus chapter 7, verses 15 and 16, here's what, after he's already said no once, after God's already sent certain plagues, here's what he says. God tells Moses, go to Pharaoh in the morning and say to him, 
the Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me to you, saying, let my people go. He says, Moses, you just go right back to him, and you go tell him who I am and tell him to let the people go. Will Pharaoh listen to God? Well, you know the story, right? Will Pharaoh listen to God? Well, the question really isn't whether Pharaoh listens to God, because we're not Pharaoh, right? The question is, will we hear God and listen to what he has to say? Will we acknowledge that God actually is the supreme authority? What do we really think deep inside? See, if in God testing us, he wants to know what we really are thinking, what's really inside, the question becomes is, what do you really think? Most of us don't have to answer that publicly, do we? What we really think inside. Most of the time, we're never asked. You can go to work. You can work at a place for five years, and no one will ever specifically ask you, what do you really think about? Is this a judgment of God in whatever's happening in their life? Does God really care? Does God do? D probably most of us never get those kind of public questions. Just recently, and I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's stemming from what Jason Carpenter shared a few weeks ago when he shared his, his, his personal commitment to Christ, and then I saw he had put it online, and I saw that same kind of message online on a Facebook post yesterday from someone else. They said, and, and they, they put this post out there on their Facebook page so that everybody they're connected to, Christians and non-Christians alike, could see, I am a follower of Jesus Christ, and this is what it means. And it was a paragraph about that long on my phone. You know, it was on one screen. You could read it. Most of us have never had to publicly answer the question. We just let other people assume the answer, right? So when you come to church, and we will eventually regather as a church, and when we come back to church, and you come into church, and you say the right words, you know, you make the right greetings, and you, and you say the right hello, and, and people ask you how you're doing, you go, oh, I'm doing great, God has been so good, and you give some of those words, you are, in some sense, letting people assume who you are and what's going on on the inside. But what does our heart really say? Is God really God? A lot of people say, well, I believe in God, but what does that God look like? Exodus chapter 7, verse 23, this verse will come on the screen as well. And Pharaoh turned and went into his house, neither was his heart moved by this. Pharaoh's heart wasn't moved by what he had seen. Has God moved your heart recently with what's going on here? Does the present crisis cause you to think about God maybe a little more? This expert I was reading this article about, his warning became a movie. It was called Contagion. That movie was made as a result of this man's research and his report on the possibility of a pandemic, and they made a movie about it, it became a big hit. Now we're living in that, and has that made you think about God more? Has, has maybe your opinion changed about how the world works? Maybe some people who are watching this, maybe some people who are even here right now with us, maybe you're a little bit angry. Maybe, maybe, maybe your business got shut down. Maybe your job got put on pause, and you don't know when it's coming back, and nobody will give you an answer. Maybe you haven't been treated right that way. Maybe you're confused. Maybe you're going, oh, I don't know. Just, I just met with uh, uh, recently with Dan and Trudy to talk about their wedding, and, and we went online, and we looked at what uh, the governor said specifically about weddings and about church services, and we're able to give Dan and Trudy a number of people who could gather legally without violating what our country is trying to do. And it really includes their family members to come to their wedding. But they want everybody else to at least see it. And we can do that. Do we sometimes get a little discouraged? Or, as a result of what we're going through, has it made your faith simply grow? And you go... As Job, I mentioned Job last week. Naked I came into the world, naked I go out. This guy I mentioned who wrote this book, or this report on the pandemic, he's 75 years of age. He says, I'm in the prime category of dying as a result of this illness. 
If I get it, one in seven chances are I die, because that's the statistics for people over 70 some years of age. So he says, so it's kind of real for me, so I'm staying in my house, and I'm not leaving, because I have a one in seven chance that I won't survive this. Does that make your faith grow? Pharaoh here is not moved. And so God decides to step up his involvement with Pharaoh. He says, you know, I'm going to test your heart, and I'm going to see where you're at, and, and if you don't move, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move past the testing to the next phase. See, God gives us plenty of chances to see him. Exodus chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Moses again goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go that they may serve me. And this is what he says then. If you refuse to let them go, I will smite all of your territory with frogs. I told the kids to pay attention to when frogs shows up. Frogs is God's punishment. See, when you fail the test of your heart, then God sometimes punishes our rebellion. See, what, what, what Pharaoh has already been doing, he's already been rebelling. He's already been hardening his heart. He's already been saying no, and he has failed the test, and now God is going to punish him for his continuing rebellion. So he brings him a plague of frogs. He, he gave Pharaoh a chance to change his mind after the frogs. He gave Pharaoh a chance to obey. He gave him a chance to surrender. He says, look, you know, and what does Pharaoh do? He refuses. So God brings lice and flies and disease and boils and hails and locusts and darkness. I get you to nine. Exodus chapter 8 and verse 15 says this. And he hardened his heart. Chapter 8 verse 32 says Pharaoh hardened his heart. Chapter 9 verse 7 says, but the heart of Pharaoh became hard. It's like every time God says, I'm testing your heart and I keep finding out it's hard, it's hard, it's hard. Every time he tested his heart, Pharaoh failed. And then he failed, and then he failed. And here's what's interesting, then he stopped testing. In the middle of this, God stopped testing. This is critically important to understand. You see, God gives us a lot of chances to listen to him, but there might be a point at which he stops giving us chances. See, is God trying to move you? Is God trying to make you a better person, a better man, a better woman, a better husband, a better wife, a better parent, a better child, a better worker, a better boss? I mean, what is God trying to do in your life? What's he trying to make you? How's he trying to move you? Some of you might go, man, I hate my job, or I hate the responsibilities, or I hate the people I work with. Or I hate the fact that my, I have people I work with who are incompetent. Or I hate the fact that they don't tell me what I need to do. Or my family, they don't pick up after themselves. Or, or they're always whining about everything. And maybe, you're and maybe God's just saying, hey, I want you to change your heart and your attitude toward people. So each time God tests our heart, what does he find? Does he find us ready to change? Does he find us ready to be redirected? Does he find us ready to surrender? Or does he see us prone to rebellion? I don't know what would happen if our government closed the roads and said, we'll deliver food to you. What if they brought the food I don't like? What if they brought me milk and bread? Why is it milk and bread is so popular as survival food? I'm thinking popcorn and soda before I'd have milk and bread. I don't know if things can get more restricted in our culture right now. And I don't know what would be the tipping point where I would get upset and angry and not just go, whatever. I don't know where it is for me. Do we welcome the test God brings? In all of these plagues in which Pharaoh hardened his heart, Israel felt the same pain. But once Pharaoh failed, and this comes in Exodus chapter 9, once Pharaoh failed, Israel must have passed the test to some degree. So they went through a series of plagues of which occurred to both Israel and Egypt, and then all of a sudden, God hardens Pharaoh's heart 
and the plagues no longer attack Israel. Notice what it says, Exodus chapter 9, verse 6. So the Lord did this thing on the next day, and all the livestock of Egypt died, but the livestock of the children of Israel, not one died. At some point, remember when, when Moses, and we didn't go through all this text, when Moses first goes to the people of Israel, they go, well, well, who are you to speak for God, and who is God? And he has to tell them God's name, and he has to demonstrate certain things with the rod that, that buds and with or turns into a snake and the, and the leprosy in his hand, and he gives them these certain proofs and yet, it seems God understood that the nation of Israel needed a few more proofs. And so they go through some of these first hardships, these first plagues, and maybe they're beginning to change their heart about Moses and about God. God is not done testing any of our hearts. I think as long as we live, as long as we breathe, God tests us. And I think sometimes the tests are difficult and sometimes they're painful. And sometimes they get tied up with his punishment of others. People who are rebellious. I don't know if what we're going through right now is God's punishment to people who are rebellious. Obviously, we live in a world that has people who are rebellious. Sometimes we're part of that problem. And I don't know. There's nothing definitive in the Bible that says, at some point I'm going to bring a certain pandemic on the world that's going to attack nations the Bible gives us a description in Revelation of judgment that way outweigh what we're facing right now. Where he destroys a third of the oceans and a third of the animals and a third of the crops and a third of the people. So we're not facing anything like that. But sometimes the tests we have are painful and difficult. What will we then do? See, the test, I think the test that God brings is not about blind obedience. It's not about... Oh, I'm just going to be scared of God, and I'm going to become his slave, and I'm going to do whatever he says. I don't think that's what God is looking for. I think God is looking for us to place our faith in him. We sang a bunch of songs this morning about his, our faith in God, our trust in him. See, is Israel going to show their faith in God? Are they going to trust God with their lives? See, if they're going to leave Egypt and go on a journey, and they're going to conquer a new land, they're going to need to trust God with their lives. Their lives might have been difficult, but they were used to it. Will they obey God and show their faith on the night when God passes over? I mentioned to your kids about the Passover. As the end of Israel's enslavement nears, as God is going to actually take the children of Israel out of Egypt, when he brings a final plague on the nation, God is ready to teach one more lesson. And the lesson is this. Who is the Lord? He's the one who sees our faith. He tests our heart. He punishes the rebellious. But he is looking to see our faith. That's what he's looking for. In chapter 12 and verse 1, there's just three verses I want you to see. Chapter 12, verse 1, it says this. This month shall be your beginning of months. All of a sudden, in the middle of this whole series of events, God says, I'm going to start the calendar all over again. This is now day one. This is January 1st. This is going to be the beginning of the year for you. See, our faith has to start somewhere. Is right now one of those moments where you have to start again? I think you can start again and again and again and again because I think we can be caught short very often and go, wow, I am really not acting like I should as a believer here. I need to start again and be better at that. Our faith has to start somewhere for the nation of Israel. In Exodus chapter 12, God is saying, here's your beginning. Here's the moment you are going to commit to believe. Here's day one. Here's where it starts. Then in verse 3 of chapter 12, he says, every man shall take for himself a lamb. Our faith not only has to start somewhere, but it requires some kind of act. You have to do something. What does God want you to do right now? What does he want you to do? For the nation of Israel, it was take a lamb. God says all through the scriptures, we're supposed to confess our sins. We're supposed to declare our repentance. We're supposed to love our neighbors. There's all sorts of things found in the scriptures and things we can do to demonstrate our faith, to show our obedience. Chapter 12, verse 7. What are they supposed to do with this lamb? Take some of the blood... And put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel. I want you to take some of the blood. I want you to paint it around the doorframe. 
Now, it's interesting. It's interesting. I, I, I read through this whole passage like twice. I was trying to find the place and the verse and the words where it says stay in the house. But it doesn't. It doesn't ever say stay in the house. They do. Because the, the, everything bad is happening outside. I can't imagine they're not staying in the house. But he says the blood is on the door and you eat the meal. You stay inside and eat the meal. I couldn't find the verse. Maybe there is a verse. And I read it through twice. Sometimes there's a verse there and you just can't see the word. You're looking for them. But here's what's interesting. Here's what we do know. Our faith has to wait. As they paint the blood on the doorpost and on the lintel, they go in and eat the meal. They know, because God has told them, that the angel of the Lord is going to pass over Egypt that night. And he's going to kill all the firstborn of the Egyptians. With the intention that if you don't do this, he might strike you. He kind of leaves that open. He doesn't say if you wander. There's no place in the scripture where he says if you wander out in the streets, you're going to die. Or your firstborn's going to die. He doesn't say that. He says, here's what you have to do. You have to paint the blood. And you have to eat the meal. It's not about them doing something. It's really about them believing who God is and waiting. When you think about it, when you think about the whole story, there's no place in the story that he, that he kind of describes and says, well, if you do A, B, C, and you don't do D, E, F, you'll be okay. No, he says, paint the blood, eat the meal. I'm going to kill people tonight. And he tells them, I'm going to kill the Egyptians, the firstborn of all the Egyptians. And he's already told me, I'm going to take you out of Egypt. And, they think, and then he says, I want you to be ready to go. Because they're supposed to be ready. They're supposed to be packed. They're supposed to be. He says, when I see the blood, this is chapter 12, verse 13. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. So he's telling him, I'm coming by. You don't know exactly when, when I'll get to your house. But I can imagine as they're, if they truly believe, if their heart has truly been moved, if they've been changed, if they're not being rebellious any longer toward God as a nation, as individuals, as people, they're sitting there in their house and they're going, when is this going to happen? And that's where we are. Isn't that where life always is? We're always in a position of waiting. Our faith has to wait on God. We don't know, we don't know what's next. We can't see the end. Every time I'm, I'm talking with someone, they're asking me, so, well, when are services going to start again? Or, or when are we going to go back to work? Or when are the schools going to open? I says, I don't know. I don't know. I suppose they will when they do. I have a feeling that the moment the schools open here in Tompkins County, I don't know about any other county, but here in Tompkins County, I have a feeling we're all going to know at least the day before. We're going to at least have 24 hours notice that the schools are opening. And then maybe the next day they're going to call snow day. I don't know. You don't know what's next. The other day I was looking on my phone, and I saw that the Dow Jones Industrial went up 2,300 points. It had a 7% rise. Well, that's pretty good after it's had, you know, a 25% drop. Do you know what's going to happen tomorrow in the stock market? No. Do you know what's going to happen tomorrow if you get sick? We don't know. What we have to do is we have to wait. We have to wait through the test. We have to wait for the test to end. And we have to wait for our grade. And then we wait for the next test. See, the test never ends. James put it, puts it this way. Be joyful of the trials that come. Because as you get to trials, you grow in your patience and your wisdom and your understanding of God. But through it all, what do you do through it all while you wait? You trust in God. You trust in him to take care of all the things that he needs to take care of. And he'll care for us in his time and in his way. And hopefully we as believers, as we interact in the limited six-foot distance. The other day I met someone at the store who I knew and we did not get closer than, it was so weird to talk to somebody from six feet away. But I just felt that was honoring what that person might fear. Because if I got closer than to talk to them from six feet away. But both of us trust God. And hopefully watch God 
do some great things in our lives as opposed to what he might do for the whole world or what he'll do through us. Dear Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be moved by the test that you bring into our lives. We don't know what might come next. We just know what we're living right now in this moment. We know, Lord, as you look into our hearts, where we need to change, where we need to be strengthened, where we need to give greater greater sense of trust in you, a greater commitment. Lord, I pray for each one who has an opportunity to watch this message. And though their desire might be to gather with other believers and enjoy that fellowship, that right now they can't. And I pray that your spirit would just be amazing in his presence and in his ministry in their lives in these moments. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. grace of Jesus that we have any hope at all in God. Dear God, I just uh, thank you for the tests you give us. Uh, I just hope that uh, we will, when the time comes for us to take those tests, that we're not only prepared, but that we're excited to take them. And 
I just pray that you will uh, guide us and direct us to uh, pass those tests and to uh, anticipate the ones to come. Uh, just be with us this week and with these coming weeks and months um, as our country and all the other countries go through this crisis. I just hope that you'll just be with all of us and uh, maybe uh, this is just a larger test that is for everybody. In your name, amen. Thank you.